do you look forward to going to work on a Monday morning? Or alternatively, like, do you have the Sunday scaries? And that's kind of how I figured out what I wanted to do. I just know that not only do I have to convince myself, but I have to convince this entire investment committee. And I really do think I became a better investor uh, because of that experience. How was your first year at HBS? So I came in with really low expectations. Low? Yes, I did. If I'm just in an Uber for 10 minutes by myself, what am I thinking about? Like, that's like a good vibe check. Where does your mind like wander I love that. when you're not busy or you're not executing, you're like doing stuff? What is dating life like at HBS? Kind of complicated, but also somewhat simple. But then during Valentine's Day, two big things happened that made dating less scary in the business school. <laughs> Welcome to Cherie's Corner, a podcast where we dive into the topic of career and hear from my friends and guests who are killing it in the business world so we can learn from their lessons, their wisdom, and their mistakes. I'm your host, Cherie. I'm currently a business school student at Stanford University, and previously I've held roles in tech and venture capital. In this episode, I interview my former colleague from Bain Capital Ventures, Ayushi Sinha. Ayushi is a second year student at Harvard Business School. Previously, she had roles in big tech, startup, and VC. Ayushi gives us the tea on what life is really like at HBS, the ups and downs of her application process, and breaks open the gate-kept industry of venture capital. Her energy is infectious, she is so sharp, and most importantly, she's a doer who is constantly on the move, experimenting, and it is just so exciting to follow her journey. Let's dive in. Hi, Cherie. Hi, everyone. For those of you who I don't know or haven't met yet, my name is Ayushi, and I'm an incoming second year, or we call them ECs, at Harvard Business School. I was born and raised in Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, went to an all-girls school, something that, you know, Cherie and I have in common, um, and then I went to Princeton, where I studied computer science. Professionally, I have done everything from attempted to start a company in the clean water and energy space to actually working at a big tech company for a little bit to working at a machine learning startup building um, sort of computer vision for radiology and then to venture capital where Sheree and I first met and now on to business school where I'm taking another stab at the whole startup thing. Could you talk a little bit more about your roles after leaving college? Absolutely. So when I was a senior in college, I had this existential crisis. I was like, wow, I've been given so much privilege to go to like these universities and to have such like skills that a lot of people want software engineers. They want PMs. They want people with a tech background. And so I felt a lot of pressure of like, I want to find the perfect fit. I actually asked all my friends who had graduated in the last like three years. And I was like, do you look forward to going to work on a Monday morning? Or alternatively, like, do you have the Sunday scaries? And that's kind of how I figured out what I wanted to do. I um, ended up going to work for a startup. It was stealth at the time. When I was in school, I really enjoyed machine learning. I enjoyed math, but I didn't want to go get a PhD. And I was personally a little kind of frustrated by the by how big tech worked from like bureaucracy point of view or just like the speed. I was just so used to in college being like, I have an idea, like I want to put together like a one pager and then just go like iterate. And so for me, I think a startup was a good fit because I felt like I had the autonomy. I feel like I was working with really brilliant people who also were very invested in like wanting to mentor me. Mm -hmm. It was also in something that I think mattered. Like my parents are both doctors and I never really could or never felt like I had a lot of impact doing a lot of just like SAS stuff <laughs> mm -hmm. and you know and like my internship in college and so for the first time I was like whoa like I can use my tech background to actually like what in my opinion was like doing some sort of like real good in the world particularly in healthcare mm -hmm. so that's what I did right out of school um was in a product role working with machine learning engineers like so much fun mm -hmm. did that for a year and a half and then I went to go work for Bain Capital on the ventures team and really enjoyed investing because I had um I've been angel investing since right out of school and started a micro VC fund while in school. But guys, it was so different because like when you're in a large multi-stage fund, you have to learn how to convince people of your point of view versus before that I could kind of just invest whatever, whatever I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I found that I was having to hold myself to like a really high bar. 
just know that not only do I have to convince myself, but I have to convince this entire investment committee. And I really do think I became a better investor uh, because of that experience. So the first deal I actually brought to um, our former boss actually was one that I was obsessed with. Um, it's called Marriage Pact. And um, I met the founder, like, I guess like a year or two before bringing the deal. And I actually had known his girlfriend since like high school science fair. So just in terms of like <laughs> people wise, was getting a really good vibe check of like, is this someone who's going to just take this money and run away with it? Mm. And, like, no. Like, is this someone who is doing this because they really genuinely believe in this problem and are not doing it just because they want to make a lot of money or for the fame or for the ego like absolutely so I think one I felt really strongly about the person because it was very early stage and I needed to be confident with that to bring it to um, our former boss but you know the really interesting thing was um, the first time I brought it um, my former boss was like hey I agree the sky is great but like we just don't really do consumer um, which is super fair. Like if you like have specialty in certain things like fintech, it makes sense to pass on a deal that's not in that specialty. And so at first I was like, that's fair. I can't, you know, I don't think I can argue with that. So I just kind of let it go. But then a month later, obviously Lee and I still like text and talk. And he was like, Ayushi, we just had some huge news. And so it was really important for me in this news basically was um, they had launched something that had um, like a daily product versus just like a once a year product. Mm. And to me, seeing those results in the data to be like, wow, people love this and they're using it, not just in like the super like overhype thing, but in, like a very um, consistent way was for me the piece of data that I needed to feel convinced, but also to then bring it back to the partners. Um, and then what I saw was in terms of how to like hone that skill set, after I developed conviction, I realized it's all about finding a right fit. And so our former boss focused on more like fintech or more like application software, something that was more enterprise. And honestly, like, I don't think he would have been the best fit for Marriage Pact and like vice versa. So I think our former boss did a really good job of being like, hey, I'm not a good fit, but I agree. Like this new piece of data, like fundamentally changes the question. I think our fund actually would maybe consider doing something that's not in our like specialty, but go talk to this other partner, Christina, um, because she just has a background that's more relevant to consumer. So the thing that that story is trying to say is in terms of the skill set, you have to know your audience. I think it's really important to like go through your manager, particularly when you're a junior investor, to make sure they're on your side, that they can give you insight because they know what the other partners are like thinking, what their specialties are. And that's how we got the deal done. So to really go from being like, okay, we pass on this deal to actually coming back and being like, ah, I know I'm really putting myself out there because this is literally my first month on the job. But like, this is why I think things are different from when we last passed. And this is sort of the path forward to find the best partner founder fit at this firm. That takes a lot of, um, one, guts. <laughs> Two, also a lot of emotional intelligence, not only working with the founder and maintaining a relationship even after like the first time passed, but also emotional intelligence in working with your immediate boss and then working across with your immediate boss with another partner. So you have to kind of understand like what motivates the people like in your orbit and to make sure that you kind of align their motivations with like what you're bringing them deal wise. Totally. I kind of see that as your superpower. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm working on it. I definitely don't have it figured out. For the people out there who are new to this field, could you give like a brief description of like what VC even is and maybe how early stage VC might differ from late stage VC? Venture capital is like part of like the financial system and it's a group of funds and, and just people who basically say, we're going to go collect a lot of money from wealthy people like Mark Zuckerberg or from universities like Stanford institutions institutions exactly yeah. and we're going to take that money and then we're going to invest it into people who have really good ideas um, and who are building really early stage companies you don't really have a ton of data points oftentimes it's like pre-product pre-revenue but that's sort of like the stage at which we come in and the sort of mindset of the bets that we take I define early stage as like pre-seed seed that's just what I do that definition might change, but you can think about like, let's say under like $5 million um, a check. And so what we, I think as venture capitalists do in that stage is think, okay, who are amazing people with really great ideas 
that have the ability to both like change the world and you know make potentially like let's say a billion dollars or like a 10x return on this check that i give you and so that's a sort of framing the whole point of venture capital is to like return money but i think the secret sauce is these venture capitalists are basically arguing that they understand the people side of things mm -hmm. and they understand the tech side of things and the business side of things at the early stage much better than any institution could sort of do themselves mm -hmm. which is why they're like that's why you should give me your money mm -hmm. rather than like stanford go invest in like every single student that comes out of gsb totally each partner argues that they have a very specific thesis like how they see the world, how they see this space evolving. Mm -hmm. And that's their own secret sauce as to why they are a great investor. Not only do they have relationships with startup founders, but they also have a specialty or an expertise yeah. in the space. The later stage investing, and I'll call it growth, is kind of the stage after. So when a company has revenue and when they're thinking about becoming profitable or maybe are already profitable, um, that's when the growth stage investors come in and they have a very different skill set. They're super comfortable looking at Excel's and modeling out, okay, this is currently how the business makes money based on a platitude of things from like where we think the market is going. Um, do we think that they have a way to consistently, you know, get these sales and go to market? Um, do we think that they're going to be expanding into a new geography or like maybe a new product area? They get to then take this view of what do we need to believe about the future state of the world and like this company? Um, and these financials and it's called like the what must we believe test in order for this company to make like a 5x return on investment for example and so that's i think the framing that they use to then look at all these models and you really have to get deep within the numbers and then that's when you do a ton of like expert calls for example my one growth experience was looking at um a fintech startup in emerging market and so we called all these like American competitors, but then we also called all of these competitors in that geography who were adjacent or directly competitive and being like, okay, how do you go to market? What is it like to actually, you know, set up systems where you're converting like cash to like mobile money? And so it's a very different sort of diligence because you have way more data points. For early stage versus growth stage, mm -hmm. different skill sets. Required. Absolutely. And potentially different interests too. I think so, yeah. I think if you're someone who like loves getting to know people and likes thinking about like where's the world going in terms of what technologies or what like markets or what trends, I think early stage probably is a better fit. But if you're like, yeah, I want to get like deep in the weeds with the numbers, I don't think early stage is going to be a good fit because there are no numbers. <laughs> 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 yeah so definitely think about like what keeps you up at night and like where your curiosities are and yeah. if it's excel i would not do early stage Makes sense. shifting gears to the mba program mm -hmm. you applied two plus two and i'd love mm -hmm. to hear as you were an undergrad what was the thinking behind that i wish there was a lot of thinking but honestly my friend leora applied a year before me and she was super similar backgrounds and I really looked up to we actually worked on a couple of projects together used to hold a patent together like we were homies <laughs> I was like one of her bridesmaids so she had applied a year before me and honestly I was like mm, it seems like a nice to have I actually didn't get into HBS 2 plus 2 I got in um to Booth and Kellogg you know I was going to a startup and I was like okay if this doesn't work out I can <laughs> here's the safety net mm -hmm. um and so in some ways it was a nice way to think about what I wanted to go do aspirationally, I could just go do, and then knowing that I could always have a fallback plan. Mm -hmm. Well, I know you said that it didn't take much thinking, but really, I think planning ahead to have a fallback plan is um, is some thinking. That's fair. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess specifically timeline-wise, yeah. she had gotten in um, at the end of my junior year, mm. and so that summer, I was in Microsoft, um, had interned there sophomore year as well. And it was just becoming really clear that that's not where I wanted to start my career. And I was lucky to get a return, but junior year, I was like, oh, I need to figure out what I want to do. And if that is go to work for a startup, I want to make sure that I just have, again, some sort of safety net. Mm -hmm. And so honestly, I spent that summer studying for the GMAT. And of course I had fun, but I didn't like really go out. I like honestly would every weekend do a practice test at the library in Cap Hill. 
afterwards I guess I would finish and then I would like call my grandparents because they were in India and my parents were asleep and like my friends were all out partying and I was like okay I guess I'll just call my grandparents because they're the only ones who are awake <laughs> really did put in the sweat equity like early on and I think it was so nice because I didn't have to worry about it during the school year right. um and now so really smart yeah, because now my friends were having to study for like the GRE and GMAT, and I'm like, I could not. <laughs> yeah. The startup I was at was in the process of getting acquired, and that's when I had to just like think really deeply as a forcing function, like, do I want to go to the acquiring company? Do I want to get another job? And I think all roads really led to, I want to go start a company in the healthcare uh, machine learning space, but... I have a lot to learn in healthcare mm -hmm. and it was pretty obvious to me that like Boston was a place to be for all things healthcare and HBS has such a strong entrepreneurial scene but also has like really great track record of uh, venture as well which is kind of like a secondary career path and so I think Booth and Kellogg are phenomenal schools but because of that forcing function of uh, like the job I thought was my dream job like just not going to exist for me anymore after this acquisition it just forced me to think about what I wanted and I don't think personally that like Kellogg and Booth were a good fit because I was looking for something that was going to be more healthcare focused, more entrepreneurship focused, and more venture focused, but again, early stage venture, like not late stage. Cause I think Booth is like a phenomenal finance program. Kellogg has a phenomenal marketing program. Mm -hmm. And those were just like less relevant to my personal career goals. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like in your last year, you've been able to like really tap into those resources or also like some of the resources on Harvard's campus, like iLab? Yeah, I guess on the entrepreneurship side of things, I've been super impressed by like the Harvard iLab and like the Rock Summer Fellow. So that's what I'm doing this summer. Oh yeah. Yeah. And so I've been really, it's been a good community and I'm really thankful that um, it's a program because otherwise I feel like it can definitely get the perception of like, oh, I shouldn't get a job this summer, which is why she's like working on a startup. And it's like, no, 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 like I applied to this. Like mm -hmm. this is something that I get funding for. This is something that is legitimate, which like, I wish I didn't care about that, but a little part of me does. <laughs> it's totally legitimate. It's super competitive. Well, also, I'm biased because I'm doing the mirror program <laughs> at Stanford, which this is the Rock Summer Fellow and mm -hmm. at Stanford. It's called the Both the Chan Go like, Initiative. So fun. it's like the, the same thing yeah. where we get funding. Um, but no, like there was an application process. Yeah. And they have really good programming. It's remote, right? Um, well, so the accelerator part is in person once a month, oh. um, which inspired my nomadic lifestyle. Yes, <laughs> so we have to go back to Cambridge once a month mm -hmm. to be in person, but then for the, is it a two month program? I three months. <laughs> so then for three months, you yeah. can be abroad minus these like in person yeah. check ins. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so cool. Honestly, so the Both the Chan program is all remote. Mm -hmm. And there's not that many people in Palo Alto. Yeah. So the check-ins we've had are all over Zoom. Like, I go in person, but there's, mm -hmm. like, three of us in the <laughs> program there. But it's, yeah. like, nice, the people I can see. But that's really interesting. I wonder if the programs talk to each other. They should. They should. Or should we host a little, like, <laughs> collab? <laughs> Wait, we should. Wait. <laughs> I'm done. Going back to your summer project, could you talk a little bit more about what you're doing this summer? I'll share what the OG plan was and then what's happening now. So originally, I was spending the summer working on my own startup called Turmeric and thinking about how can we connect diverse patients to the right clinical trial by going through um, like the providers and specifically working with oncologists. I worked on that for the first couple of weeks. I have amazing interns who've been very supportive through that. But then it became increasingly clear to me that that is not a really good way to capture value and to be a venture backable company. And so we're still working on that, but I'm also now exploring other ideas from the psychedelic space to the generative AI space applied to maybe like generating protocols for research. I think for the rest of the summer, my goal very much is to tinker on all of these MVPs. And I'm very lucky that we have design partners for like each of those projects. And then basically at the end of the summer to say, okay, which of these projects is really hitting a problem that I feel like I could work on for 10 years mm -hmm. because I want to go work on this startup um, in this like healthcare AI space. But that's a commitment. That is at least 10 years. You have like a ton of wonderful ideas to like go after. Is it more like an internal like vibe check? Are there like external metrics that you're kind mm -hmm. of looking at? How are you going to validate it? 
So in terms of the internal vibe check, <laughs> I um, I think I just got really lucky that I worked on projects where like I went to bed thinking about these problems and woke up thinking about them. Like if I'm just in an Uber for 10 minutes by myself, what am I thinking about? Like that's like a good vibe check. Where does your mind like wander I love that. when you're not busy or you're not executing or like doing stuff? Um, so that's the first thing. I love that. <laughs> because I feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> Like what? Yeah. Like, yeah. If you can take it one level deeper, like when you're in the shower, yeah. what are your shower thoughts? And can you have thoughts <laughs> about your shower thoughts? Because that's like reflection. Mm -hmm. And honestly, some of my best thoughts come in the shower or when I'm alone in the Uber and like yeah. I have a second like to be by myself and I don't have my phone to grab to like yep. distract myself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, your, your Uber <laughs> thoughts are my shower thoughts. <laughs> Which, and knowing that we both, I think, are in that, like, creative flow space, yeah. um, something I'm actually trying to create more spaces for myself, and I'm nomadic this summer, just crashing on my friends' couches. Thank you, friends. You're all the best. <laughs> you know <who> you are. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> um, and so, I think for me, this summer, creating that space has actually been, like, going on a run every day and being, like, Okay, I'm gonna just like <laughs> hit the big booty mix because it's just like can't touch mm, it. I can't look at my booty. phone. Yeah, but it's like high energy. Yes. Um, and then just think. And so I think that's how I've like tried to create that creative space for me because showers are great, but I would rather like try to create a 30 minute sh mm -hmm. like shower vibe kind of experience of me running because it's just more my control. Yeah. Um, not quite there yet because I do get distracted. <laughs> and sometimes I get lazy and I start walking, but <laughs> that's okay. you're still doing your thinking time in the uber to reflect which yeah. is the vibe check but then also some maybe like external yeah. metric passion which is the vibe check the second really and this is kind of what the vc comes out in me is like mm -hmm. is this going to be a billion dollar business because i think that i've worked on startups in the past where like they weren't venture back well that's fine but then you just have to keep begging people for money mm -hmm. and if i really want to make all the impact that i want in the world like i don't want to keep begging people for money and maybe that's just me being too naive Maybe I will always be fundraising, but I really just want to like focus on the problem and I want to go build solutions and test the solutions and not worry about like, oh, how should I frame this to this investor? How should I frame this to this philanthropist? Like ask them for more money. I really will only move forward with projects that have a viable, sustainable business model, meaning that there's a path to profitability. Um, and that also ones that are venture backable, meaning that they have a path to like making a hundred million ARR, mm -hmm. not now, obviously, <laughs> but in a couple of years, um, because I think that that is a sort of generational company I want to build mm -hmm. so I can just kind of sustain myself. Like I think I look at, don't kill me for saying this, like a Google or a Microsoft and like those leaders can really take the big bets that they want because they have the strong balance sheets. And I guess maybe that's where the business school comes in is like one of my favorite cases was about this lumber company. And they were like, okay, this lumber company, mom, pop lumber company, they have amazing margins, but why do they have to keep borrowing money? And then you look into it and it's something simple as like, well, they're getting paid every 90 days, but they are having to pay their suppliers every 30 days. And even that as like how you architect your business from the business model to like, accounts payable, accounts receivable, all these things that I now can look out for because I've taken these, albeit didn't like finance, <laughs> finance classes, yeah. <laughs> or marketing classes, or strategy classes, um, are really the sort of check mark that I have about is this an idea that I'm going to pursue and like does there exist a business model that will capture value for me and the person I'm serving in a way that like accrues value and like will have me going back to people asking them for money. All in all, all things considered, how was your first year at HBS? So I came in with really low expectations. Low? Yes, I did. I went to one class during Admitted Students Day weekend, and it was like a second year class, and like no one cared. Mm -hmm. And I was like really nervous about the academic experience. And because, I Because you care. Because I care a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Not about the grade, but it's like, I love I'm school. Learning. Like I'm guys, curious. I'm like the major nerd. <laughs> And I was like, oh my gosh. Um, and so in terms of how's it been class-wise, I've actually learned a ton. I think that there's one thing to like learn from people who've done well or people who've failed. Like the cases are great, but more so, I think they actually do a really good job crafting the classes. And I think it's almost like 50% of my classmates are international. Someone fact check me. And that really shows. Like even something like a tech layoff case that I was like, Ugh please. I know everything there is to know about this. Um, that's just not true. I think that, for example, 
two of my classmates from Italy and from South Africa had like such interesting points of view that I never considered or even knew existed. Mm -hmm. And so for me, a lot of learning in this, even though the required curriculum is just like maybe boring if you came from like consulting or finance because you probably already knew it. But for me, one, the information is all new. And two, like I think the international perspectives on this information is like fundamentally game changing. Especially if the business... 100 million ARR business that you want to build is a global one. Yeah. Having this global perspective in the classroom is really important. And 50% sounds right. At, I think at the GSB, it's around like 40, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit more than that. So I think that sounds right. Elementary school, Yushi would have just like never, ever imagined that she was going to yeah. be in a classroom mm -hmm. with people from such like diverse backgrounds. Yeah. Um, again, I do think they are like culturally internationally diverse, not socioeconomically diverse, not really professionally diverse, but mm -hmm. I'll take what I can get, I guess. <laughs> so Ayushi, regarding the MBA application, what are ways you think current applicants can stand out from the crowd? Wow, I don't think I have um, a secret sauce or silver bullet, but one thing that I really recommend, particularly younger students about to apply to the deferred program or new grads is think about again this idea of like where is your curiosity taking you and whether that's doing more side projects at work like maybe there's a new team that's spinning up and you can do a little part-time work with them or what's probably easier and more likely is maybe there's a startup that you can go work for either during your summer or on the weekends again it doesn't have to be a full-time commitment but I think that way you can show that you have gone out of the beaten path to pursue something you care a lot about. Um, and I think that holds for both MBA applications as well as any grad school applications. Like for example, one of my interns is in med school who cares a lot about like smoking cessation. And by working with us on this app, right, she's able to show that I don't just do the med school thing, which is just like studying in the library. I actually care a lot about patient impact. And mm -hmm. so I recognize that technology is the future. And so I want to actually share my perspective and like co-create what I think the future should be. And I do think working on a side project or working on a startup probably gives you a little more visibility. Um, you can like iterate more versus sometimes I think at a big tech company, it's just slower mm -hmm. and you can't always talk about what you've done. And so if you want to make sure that your application is as strong as possible, show that you're following your curiosity and you're actually shipping things and doing things that people engage with and like interact with your products that you've put out into the world. And honestly, like if there's a startup founder who you think is really cool or there's a space that you want to learn more about, you don't have to have past experience. Mm -hmm. I would just DM them yeah. and be like, hey, I think the work you're doing is great. This is what I can do and this is how I want to grow and learn. Like, how can I help? Mm -hmm. I think that's so well received. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, anyone listening should just hop on LinkedIn or Twitter or email yeah. and just like sign the DMs. Awesome. <laughs> and if people are really interested in, in your work this summer and also next year, can they just like LinkedIn DM you? Yes, please. Or send me an email, asinha at um, mba2024.hvs.edu. I'll reply. Um, we'll put it in the description <laughs> amazing. So can what is your relationship status? <laughs> um, I'm single as a Pringle. <laughs> so we all are. Yeah. Oh, I like that. I'm going to start saying that now. <laughs> um, what is dating life like at um, business school at HBS? Kind of complicated, but also somewhat simple. So for context, um, I actually like came in to business school in a long-term relationship. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. So I think for me, like for a while, I was like a little nervous about dating just because the person I was dating was also at business school. So anyways, I was just like, I'm just not, whatever, just not going to deal with this. But then during Valentine's Day, two big things happened that made dating less scary in the business school so one marriage pack dropped Ooh. <laughs> and it's just like an inherently social it's thing it's full circle yeah it's great so marriage pack dropped or launched yeah um and then two we um are in sections at hbs which means that you take all your classes with the same 90 people i love them they're amazing but i like personally wouldn't want to like go on dates with someone who i take all my classes with it's too close yeah it's but too close. oh and it's great for people for whom that's worked out that's just not my style um, but also they're the people you know the best. And so it's kind of like, wait, how do I meet people outside of this 90 person section? So, um, the sections all got together and all the cuffed people 
pitch the single people in their sections. And then it was really nice because then everyone kind of knew one who was single and looking. And so like my friends pitched me and they were really nice about it. Oh my it. god, you were pitched. <laughs> I was pitched. Yeah. Um, and it was like such a like fun, wholesome, chill thing. And I actually like went on a couple of dates after that. And I think I was really impressed because I feel like after going on like a first date to like play squash or like, um, which I, I'm so down for like the play squash as like a first date. Cause it's like, if it doesn't work out, you can just be like, Oh, we're just friends now, you know, You're so <laughs> or, like, <laughs> or like coffee or ice cream or even yeah. dinner. And I think I've been actually like, so, um, unfortunately surprised, but like in a good way that honestly, the HBS guys are really gracious and like, those people I went on like first dates with after the um, mixer are like, we're friends now. It's chill. I see them in like the dining hall and they're just like lovely and gracious, even though it didn't work out because I yeah. think there's a shared understanding that like people are trying to find their life partner. And so I don't know if it doesn't work out on a first date, like I can still respect you as a friend in person and like think that there might be someone else who's like a better fit for you and like vice versa. So I thought it was going to be like gossip central and it definitely is. But I think the people you go on dates with, they're very gracious and understanding. Wow. I am so surprised. <laughs> yeah, no, I was too. <laughs> GSB is like a little less than half the class mm -hmm. of HBS. So it feels much smaller and closer knit um, in that way where like we already know every like for the most part, we like met everyone. Yeah. I'm like terrified of dating because of what and, you know, I shouldn't live my life in fear. Yeah. But like what if, you know something goes wrong the community is so small and it is gossip central yeah. at school um it sometimes feels like we're back in high school i think that's very true like if you go on one date with someone you just have to assume everyone in their section knows <laughs> that's because just what they, i assume <laughs> because they see you on, do people see you on dates or is it more just like the talk the i think chat? both <laughs> And also for us, it's like, okay, if you're getting, like, I don't know. one-on-one -on -one dinner. Yeah, and like Harvard Square and you both are dressed up. I don't think it's like super hard to do. Yeah. This one is, I think, one of the deeper questions that I ask. What is something that you've learned about yourself over the last year? Whoa. I've learned that I make some of my deepest friendships one-on-one um, -on -one and through co-creating. Mm. I think that I actually felt very lonely the first two months because I didn't really know how to get deep and close with people in like a 90 person group and so i learned that about myself that sounds normal that sounds like how does anyone yeah. figure that out and also that when you have classes as a group you move as a group like it's it's way harder it should be even more specific though because thank you for validating that like that's like not crazy for no. me to think um i guess maybe at first i was like wait why don't i feel like besties mm. because we act like we're all really good friends but I just feel like there was a sense of, like, I didn't really know my section for a long time. Um, and then one guy was so sweet, just DM me, and he was like, hey, I feel like I haven't gotten to know you. We should get lunch. And I really think it was just on a platonic friend way. And then I realized, I was like, oh, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like I got to know him so much better after that one-on-one -on -one interaction. And so what I then realized about myself was I'm friendly, like, I like big groups, whatever, to have a good time. That's not how I make friends. Like a real friend is someone who I have one-on-one -on -one interactions with. Um, and so then I had to really go out of my way to like schedule in meals and whatever, whatever. Okay, we're gonna move into our next section, which is called hot or not. <laughs> Here, hot means favorable, popular, trending. Basically, do you have positive feelings about it? And then <laughs> not is less favorable, outdated, like less important. Case study method. Hot. <laughs> you love it. I love it. I think that, okay, not all the comments are great, but great way to get international exposure. Also, the cases are really hard. Like, we did one on, like, Theranos. Mm. We did one on Enron. Mm. We did one on, like, the Maggie Noodles case. Like, imagine having to pull, like, 300 million, like, boxes of Maggie Noodles. What do you do? Like, these are hard questions. I love them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm also a nerd. <laughs> nerd. You love the classes. You're here for the classes. Yeah. <laughs> The eye lab. Ah, oh, this is tough. Hot. It's a little far away, but I um, love the vibe, and I think it's a really good space to go, like, organically meet other founders from across the different schools. Okay, next one is section life, or, like, yeah. the HBS sections. Oh, totally hot, because otherwise you'd come in and be like, oh my god, I have no friends. <laughs> 
And so I think similar, like in college, we had like a Z group, the people you like live on your floor with. Um, and I, just, I think it's nice to have like different groups of people that you can like be friends with. And yeah. in the beginning, like they throw pre-games, they like do all these like traditions and it just seems like you have a little family on campus. Oh. I'm a big fan. HBS <laughs> preschool trips. Mm. Assuming that money doesn't matter, hot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think in the case where you like are a little strapped, I think that it's, again, it's a great way to meet people, but like all these trips are expensive. So yeah, it just depends on how much liquidity you have and how much you're willing to spend, I guess. Mm. And so I think what's nice about the trips is they're a way to like explore a new place and meet new people. Yeah. But when you have like hundreds of people, I think then you just tend to like stick to the people you know, which is fine because you love them and they're your friends. But yeah, if you're trying to meet people, I'd go on the smaller trips. Totally. That's a good piece of advice. Yeah. So we know that tuition for these MBA programs are seventy to eighty thousand dollars, but a lot of the expenses that we don't really talk about or even see are like housing and trips and stuff. How are you thinking about that? Um, that's a really good question, and it's one that I um, wish I think was more clear on like the business school website. So I'm glad you're asking it now. I think tuition is obviously a large chunk of it. But I mean, I would probably say you should add like 20K maybe every year. How that kind of breaks down is um, like a couple thousand dollars obviously towards housing. There's a whole array of housing like, depending on what your like budget is. Um, you can also do off-campus housing, which I never looked into that, so we don't know that really well. Um, but then they have apartments, that's like a lottery. But like, I knew that I was probably gonna spend like a lot more on going out to eat. So like, I was okay to kind of downsize and get a dorm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's all about what levers matter to you and that you will anticipate you wanting to prioritize spending on. I think the trips are probably the things that account for like, the largest like discretionary spending. And again, it's like totally up to you. And I think I've actually like changed my opinion on them a lot. I think I came in being like, trips are silly. Like, mm. um, of course you like get closer to people, but like, I don't need to be like torching thousands of dollars to just like go party with people. Like, I think I, that was my very <laughs> like hard stance on it. And so the first semester I actually went on a lot more retreats mm -hmm. and I love that because that was, everyone did all the logistics for you. You were not like overwhelmingly tired, whatever, whatever. And like, that was fine. The second semester I actually went on way more trips. And now I kind of like understand the whole hype about them because I do think there's something about being oftentimes in a foreign country where you are out of your comfort zone and where you're all like co-exploring together that I think has really brought me close to people particularly people who I didn't know and who weren't in my section mm. and so how do you quantify how much to spend where I think that's like on you like for example people in my section flew to London for the weekend and like that's not something I could do but because I planned way in advance and got cheap tickets, I was able to like go to the Galapagos for a week, you know? And so I realized that it's all about how much planning in advance you do. And also there are so many kinds of trips. You can be particular about which ones you want to go on. So my now updated take is like, I am willing to kind of spend on the trips that I think have a really large like cultural or like exploration or like adventure um, mm -hmm. component, whether it's Galapagos or like I went to Japan with some students who organized and they were just like went out of their way to like really show us um, their favorite parts about their home country and they like cared so much. Mm -hmm. So like a trip like that, a hundred percent, I think I would like want to go on, I think is personally worth it for me. Yeah. But again, it's so much on like, what's your financial situation? What levers, again, are you willing to sort of adjust to make it the math all work out? You don't explicitly say it, but I love that you have these like frameworks <laughs> of like, which trips do I go on? Yeah. How do I spend my money in a way that's meaningful to me and mm -hmm. that I feel like I'm getting the most out of this entire experience and that could be eating in the dining halls, but not living in like the top, top, like fanciest place on campus. Yeah. And it's going on these trips and stuff. So I love yeah. how you're kind of very um, thoughtful with like these decisions. Yeah. Well, thank you for affirming that because <laughs> like, and again, I am doing the whole startup founder thing. And so I think that's also on my mind. It's yes. not like, okay, I'm going to get like a fat signing bonus in nine months, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think that's also something that I've chosen to take that path, but I like, I am aware of it. Totally. Cool. Thank you for that. Um, and then the last section I wanted to talk about was corporate email sign-offs. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, what sign-off do you use normally? Best. 
<laughs> right, you're saying that's like the email sign off, right? Mm-hmm. Like, uh, it's Best so. Best comma Ayushi. Yes, this is. Okay. It's so boring, but it's just so safe. <laughs> yeah, very. Safe. All right, let's talk into maybe some less safe ones. Yours faithfully. Wow, that is so lovely. And a letter handwritten. Oh. You know? Yeah. Um, yours faithfully. Um, probably not in an email, definitely in a letter. Okay. Cheers. All the time. Actually, my favorite one is um, growing up, I'd always be like, cheers from Chattanooga. Oh, I like that. But I can't really do that anymore unless I'm back home. <laughs> Looking forward to your reply. I think it's a gracious way of being like, maybe you have to respond ASAP. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to internally combust. Yeah. <laughs> so only for extreme situations. Yes. Okay. Warm regards. I feel like I would use that if I am actually mad at somebody <laughs> to be like a secret code like this is not actually warm well to pat it basically being like what i just said was probably a little abrasive or maybe not like going to rub you the right way but like i want you to know that like i still care about you kind of thing keep slaying keep slaying yeah no but i should <laughs> That's the i just like that <laughs> wait i'm gonna use that <laughs> <laughs> when I email my interns, keeps like keeps like, and they'll understand. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that concludes our podcast. Wait, I like the hot or not, or like the email sign offs. Those are so fun, right? They're kind of yeah. They get you thinking about something like a little bit more random, and like it's more like yeah. gut check. You know? Exactly, which I love. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Cherie's Quarter. Thank you for tuning in. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more MBA interviews and content like this. The three main takeaways that really stuck with me. The first is her really succinct breakdown of what venture capital even is. I love how she took something super complex and distilled it down to the fundamentals. In this interview, Ayushi also went a level deeper and broke it down between early stage and growth, late stage investing, which is really helpful if you've never heard of that framing before. The second big takeaway from this conversation is Ayushi's constant reflection or vibe check. I love how she put it in the conversation when she said, when you're in the Uber by yourself, no distractions, what are you thinking about? What are the things that keep you up at night? And how do you chase that enthusiasm, that excitement, and that energy? The third big lesson from this conversation is, how do I say it? Ayushi's doer mentality. She's not afraid to put herself out there to DM people. I think one really good way to apply this in your life is if there's a company, a startup, a project that you're really interested in, all it takes is a handful of DMs. You will get no's, but all you need is that one yes to get you started. Of course, there's a mixture of luck involved, but with a lot of persistence and being unafraid of the no's, being unafraid of the rejections, you start to see the pattern of there being a lot more yeses. Thank you so much for tuning in for this episode. I'll see you next time.